Fargo, the new virtual assistant from Wells Fargo, makes banking faster and easier. Like this. Fargo, what's my checking account routing number? And this. Fargo, uh, turn off my debit card. And this. Fargo, what did I spend on groceries last month? And that's just the beginning. Do you, Fargo? You can. In the Wells Fargo mobile app. Learn more at wellsfargo.com slash getfargo. Terms and conditions apply. Your mobile carrier's availability and message and data rates may apply. Wells Fargo Bank and a member of DIC. Hi guys, quick one before we get into the episode. This episode is sponsored by Zencaster, which is the production suite that I've used from the very beginning of this podcast. And if you're interested in starting your own podcast, hang around at the end of the episode for our 30% discount referral code. Thanks. So our podcast is called Right and Wrong. Are these your notes? These are these your notes about what we're going to say? Uh, anything. Nailed it. It's a short answer. <laughs> so how many novels did you not finish? Oh my from? God, so many. <laughs> it was perfect. What are you talking about? This is not a... Ooh, a spicy question. I love it. <laughs> this is it, guys. The big secret to getting published is all the same. It's just gossip. You better hear first. <laughs> Hello, and welcome back to the Right and Wrong podcast. I'm Jamie, and today it's something a little bit different. Returning to the show is the one and only Melissa Welliver. Hey, Melissa. Welcome hey. back. Hey. <laughs> so Melissa's been on twice now before. Yep. Uh, once by yourself um, to talk about your debut dystopian YA, The Undying Tower. And that's then the again, one. That's, that's the one. You remember it. That's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> And then again with uh, the wonderful Lucy Irvine, your agent. So if anyone listening missed either of those two episodes and wants to hear all about Melissa's writing origin story, how she got her agent, all that jazz, go check out those other two episodes because today we're talking about the process, the craft, how it all happens. So Melissa, Mm. where does a story start for you? This makes it sound so dramatic, but (laughs) I think it changes depending on where you are in your writing career. So it used to be, where did the story start? It was like a strange dream I had, Mm -hmm. or uh, maybe even fan fiction quite often. So if I was watching, say, a TV series, but I didn't like the way it ended, and I would always think, oh, it'd be so much better if the girl was the main character or something like that. It would kind of start there and then grow and grow into something completely different from whatever I'd been watching or reading. Whereas now, when you're under deadline and you're supposed to be pitching stuff and your agent's asking oh what other things are you thinking of can you send five pitches I'm like five (laughs) five different things I've got to think of um then I think then I start to look more into um filling that creative well so I guess also kind of the fan fiction thing so if I'm struggling I go through and all my favorite music and um it might come from that or it might come from um like a TV show or a book or something um, and start to try and piece together what I like about all those things and then come up with something. So instead of like inspiration hitting or a weird dream or something, (laughs) I try and piece something together from my favorite things. So that for me is where it starts. And then I try and see via plotting if there's anything there. Okay. So whereas, you know, before you were signed with an agent, had publishing, you know, all the publishing stuff, you had the luxury of waiting for inspiration to strike but now you need to summon it that's a really good way of putting it yeah it's not that also it's not that inspiration doesn't strike and it sometimes strikes midway through if i'm thinking of i'm like oh but how do i make these two elements work together and then i may wake up with inspiration or have an idea and pop it in my phone still but i think certainly you can't you don't have the luxury of waiting around and hoping something will happen you've got to sit in front of the blank word document and (laughs) <laughs> try and write something down so it is really different is it different for you how where do your ideas come from um i think it's kind of similar i i usually have sort of i picture scenes a lot mm-hmm. and then i usually grow the sort of worlds and the stories out of certain scenes and it's funny that you mentioned um obviously i think a lot of us get ideas from television from other stories like reading yeah uh but music um has always been like a very big part of my life and um, sometimes I'll listen to a song and Mm. I'll just sort of play like a scene will play in my head and I'll I'll put the song on repeat and I'll be maybe just go for a walk or something with this song on repeat and I'll see this scene playing out playing out playing out and then and then I kind of backtrack from there and I say okay 
so i've got this really epic you know like scene whatever's happening in there like action sequences you know big showdown kind of thing and then i'm like let's rewind that how did we get here what was the mm-hmm. character motivation from that and that mm-hmm. is where a lot of my stories come from or the uh, and then i usually on top of that is i love puzzles and like rule systems and like games and stuff yeah so naturally i love hard magic systems or like very clearly stated ruled magic systems yeah um, and you know I, I i just i've sometimes i'll just be so excited about a certain system of magic that i've thought of that i'll be like oh i have to create this whole world there's no story it's just a world that exists <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of coming from the world that's that's funny actually i did um i did a, a world building class once with um kezia lupo who you've had on and works at chicken house as an editor yes, and, and it was yeah i know you, you may have heard of her uh, <laughs> and she did this great um class which it was world building but it was essentially actually how to come up with an idea for a plot and it mm-hmm. was you draw a map doesn't matter if you're rubbish at drawing maps like me you can totally do it and she asks you to put sort of uh, two things on the map and then something to split them so say you might have to put a house and some woods but then you split it with a river or if there's no water on your map after you've st- like finished drawing she says think about why there's no water what's different about your world why does the map look like that is it because there's water magic has it not rained for a hundred years how do people live if it's not rained for a hundred years and i thought it was really good because it it really helps again i think if you have to come up with an idea out of nowhere you're having to try and pitch something it was a really good way in through the world building because it does make you come up with rules and then when you come up with the rules you think well who would be the worst possible person that you could put in this scenario who would have like the worst time <laughs> and that's the main character of course <laughs> obviously yeah, yeah. Did you, you, the main character is just the character that you mess with the most and that's yeah of that's course how it's yeah, yeah that's oh, yeah, a, no, that's a really good way of doing it i love that yeah that's because i read a lot of fantasy so i i read a lot of worlds where there's heavy world building and sometimes you you look at it like um like a brandon sanderson um mm-hmm. the stormlight archives like the kind of the levels of world building are so complex and they all stack on one another and when you kind of take a step back from it you look and think oh that happens because of that which happens because of these things and they all coexist for example yeah. in, in in the world in Stormlight archives there's this huge storm that rolls around the whole world mm-hmm. and that that kind of goes into the tiniest details of like the grass and the shrubbery shrinks into the ground when things come near it in the world and like the direction that all buildings are built in and face is because that's the direction the storm that rolls around that's the world so clever in. yeah and so visual right but yeah. when you apply sort of Kessia's approach to it and you yeah. say okay here's a simple world what's the what's the kind of interesting thing like oh there's a storm that goes around it and then you say okay because now it's still very simple right it's just a it's just a world that we're familiar with and and then you say okay how does that affect you know the way that the animals what the wildlife is like so the wildlife in stormlight is a lot of um sort of hard shelled creatures which Mm -hmm. are like you know resistant to uh battered of batterings of winds and stuff like that and like getting wet doesn't matter so much there's not that much fur in, right. in the world so all of these little details which when you come into the book seems so complicated and, and you, i try and think well how do you come up with all of that if you do it one step at a time like cassie is saying yeah it makes a lot more sense yeah and i think um feeds into i think stephen king kind of talks about that as well doesn't he like to badly paraphrase him he talks <laughs> about the what if scenario so yeah he says it's like a fossil that you find on the beach like when you start with the fossil you kind of have a chisel and hammer just to get to like the main bit of fossil but then mm. you start to break down into simpler tools to get deeper and deeper um and so obviously like one of his i think it's really easy to think of it is under the dome is about a town and a dome appears and they all live under it it's very it's, it does what it says on the tin but it's great because it comes up with all these things like if a dome appeared around your town well how big would it be and if it's that big what's at the center and if that's at the center then how are the people living can they breathe does it rain um is there enough food can people get in and it creates all of these scenarios all these what if scenarios just from one what if and so yeah it can seem really really complex big world but actually kept quite simple and i think that's the key to a really good fancy or speculative setting is actually the thing at the very core is very simple yes. and easy to grasp and then you can or even it's really nice well when you reward the reader because you've already thought yourself well what about how how would the the grass be in this one oh, oh okay you thought of that oh there it is and it's like you <laughs> kind of uh, working it out for yourself which is really nice yeah no i love that that's on the world building but in a similar trend 
I watched um, some of Neil Gaiman's masterclass and mm-hmm. he, this is more about the story and the narrative, but he very much does. A, most of his ideas come from, he, I think one of his stories, he's watching A Midsummer Night's Dream and he said, oh, well, what if, uh, what if the fairies were the ones that put on the play? Right. And, and, and that's like a whole story for him. So he'll be watching something and he goes, oh, well, what if uh, the villain was actually the hero? Yeah. And then he'll just write a whole story. Uh, based on that yeah i love that and that's like that's like coming back around to the fan fiction thing i do that all the time i'm like oh i'd love this but i really wish that this person was the main character i wish we had more about this yeah and it can totally spark up a whole story i mean you look at how popular the fairy tale retellings are yeah they swap genders and they swap roles and like they turn people upside down and things like that yeah yeah that's killing them though okay so that so that's how we get inspiration Mm -hmm. once you have the the world and a do you have the, so you have the world and the character or and the story which, which which do those sort of all come together before you start planning uh yes probably because they're the main so with the undying tower for instance mm-hmm. my first thing was what if uh people never died and i was especially thinking didn't age yeah. and then i thought well, actually, like that would be, you know, if that was everybody, that's easy. But what if it was just some people? And then that started to develop a bit of plot. Like, okay, if it's just some people, would other people be jealous? Or would these people be powerful? Or would they be an underclass? And in mind, they're an underclass. And then lastly, I always think, okay, I've got this great, nice idea. I can think of some scenes and some plot areas. Who's the worst possible person I can put in this situation? (laughs) So obviously in the Undying Tower, I thought, well, how about somebody who thinks they're really privileged and in one part of society but actually they're one of the underclass and they didn't know the whole time um Mm. so yeah i think character actually comes last even though i think voice is for me the most important interestingly but i don't write anything down until i have the whole plot in my head and on paper so for me it doesn't matter that the character comes later yeah yeah, yeah. you you're Mm. a you're a hardcore planner (laughs) i am a hardcore planner we can talk about that (laughs) (laughs) i've heard i've heard the like twice daily nine step process of your planning before but it's what is the overall like do you have a game plan that you've sort of honed in and and it's sort of almost formulaic at this point when you approach writing a new story of how you plan it all out uh i think so so i'm a big subscriber to save the cat so i'm sure a lot of Mm -hmm. people listening will know what save the cat is but just in case you don't know what save the cat is it is essentially that old adage of there's only seven stories save the cat says there are i think there's is it 12 or 15 um genres and each of those has 15 plot points you've got to hit in order to uh make your audience feel rewarded and to make sure that you cover all the parts of the story you're supposed to. So I really like that because it gives you 15 plot beats um, to to hang your entire story around and it means you're not going to go off on a tangent. But I go a little bit further. And so, for instance, it's talking formulaic. Whilst maybe the story might not be because, you know, obviously all those writers are super original and come up with super original (laughs) stories. Um, I am really formulaic with, I plot, I get a blank Word document I write out chapters one to 25. I write 3,000 words per chapter and I write 25 chapters. And I put the plot beats scattered into those chapters depending on how long each plot beat is. I work out percentage-wise with a calculator how many thousands of words each plot beat lasts for and where they appear and then when each chapter blends into the next plot beat. And I always write 75,000 words for the first draft. So that's like, that is quite... That's crazy. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) it's really weird, isn't it? (laughs) It was not weird for me, but... I I get the set... And when you say you write, uh, was it 2,000 or 3,000 words? 3,000 words per chapter. chapter. Obviously obviously not 3,000 on the dot. It's, you know... No, but I am usually, funnily enough, because I've been doing it for so long, pretty close. I get to the end (laughs) of a chapter and I check and I'm within 100 words. It's actually pretty freaky. And I think I came to 3,000 words, by the way, just because I looked up 10 of my favorite books and worked out an average of how long the chapters were. That's that's a good way to do it because those are obviously books that inspire you. So you're going to want to do a similar pacing kind of to that. That's a really good reason for doing it. I hope you don't add like adverbs and stuff to hit that 3000 <laughs> no no i'm not like it doesn't have to be exactly and sometimes they're a little bit short but to be honest if i'm a fair bit short i will go back and see i just know myself something will be slightly missing if it, mm. i'm running short but it's really rare i usually get to about 3000 words it's weird it's a, i mean it's such a stylistic cho- choice as well because mm. you know there's some some books where 
it's lots of short chapters and that's quite in, in YA that's quite common as well and then yeah. other books where the chapter length is entirely variable and, right. and sort of tied into varying pace throughout the book so it's interesting that you go for, for a set length and then always 75,000 works kind kind of makes sense I think just because it's a sort of industry standard right yeah that's what it so um my agent likes to send out well once I remember once I was drafting something up and I said you know I'm adding a lot into here how long is too long how short's too short and of course she said the thing that's quite annoying which is it's subjective and we you know nothing's technically too long nothing's technically too short however if you could keep it between 80 and 85,000 for the editors to read which I think is interesting because I'm working on a standalone with an editor right now and it's hit over 90 yeah. But that was whilst editing with her, and that seems to be okay. I think they like to <laughs> add a bit in themselves and yeah, like help yeah. you flesh out those bones. But I like to keep it shorter and then add to it rather than have it sprawling and really long, which I did do with my first book and having to chop huge chunks out. I hate that. Yeah, I I was having this. I was literally having this discussion with a friend the other day. Yeah, and I was saying that when you come to the editing process, it I think it's a much. Um, I don't know how to say. I want to say healthier, but that's probably not an appropriate word. <laughs> it, <I laughs> Nothing healthy much, about writing. Much better like, mentally, for me at least, if I've underwritten and my editing is additive as opposed to reductive. Yeah, I think that's true. I just, I, I also worry that if you have to cut out, which again, I have had to do before, I entered a competition with my first book and it was 125,000 words. It was insanely long. Ooh. And I entered it into a competition for middle grade and they said the top limit was 60,000 words. <laughs> and I thought, ah, yeah, it's fine though. And then I actually got listed for the competition and they wanted the rest of the book. So I'd send in like the first 15,000 words and then they wanted the rest. Well, obviously it was too long. So I had to cut <laughs> half the book. So I ended up just cutting whole characters and stuff and hacking away at it. Oh, by the time I read back through, it wasn't even just that it didn't necessarily make sense. It was just obviously so skinny in parts because there were whole characters missing and whole plot lines missing because it was the only way to cut it down. Whereas I'd much rather add those things very slowly and gently later mm. than have to hack away at it with the cutting knife afterwards, which is just awful. Yeah. And especially if you're writing something that has a, a complex you know, world and uh, multiple characters, mm. uh, if you, you know, taking, obviously taking a whole character out is going to require much patching and holes to plug. But like even often just taking out one detail, like one chapter where one thing happened has yeah. like such big knock on effects that it's just a huge process sometimes. It does. It always feels like my least favorite part of editing is always the developmental edits which are the first round of edits because yeah. it feels like I take something that's fairly polished from the last draft you know say it's a draft three or four or the one I even a publisher has bought and then their editor goes through it and says okay so we're starting again with developmental edits because <laughs> we're going to develop this book and you look at it and you think I'm taking something fairly polished and I've got to pull it apart <laughs> and you feel like you're pulling a thread on a jumper and it just comes completely unraveled and you have to re-knit it and it's horrible whereas yeah. obviously later stages of editing is quite nice because you're just picking up little sentences here and there but yeah d I find it really really tough because I'm not saying author I don't know about you Jamie but I don't um you know lots of people swear by having all their scenes on cards so they can quote unquote move them around now I've heard this before I have mm. no idea how you would do it <laughs> so they talk about like oh yeah it's great because you can just move scene 12 to scene three and I'm like what do you mean you can't just move I don't understand how people do that I think it's like magic I don't get it I I'm trying to think how that I, well I use Scrivener so I write on right. and, and Scrivener lays it I mean you can there's a million different things to, I, I I think I know about how to use one percent of Scrivener it's so yeah I feel like everyone on Scrivener says that but uses different parts <laughs> yeah <laughs> but they, it very much has that card system I you can open up the card view and just reorder things yeah I'm trying to think I mean I could see if you have an on a, a big ensemble cast and mm. you're jumping between POVs, it could be easy to move around. Although that, that being said, yeah, I, I wrote a chapter recently that was very early on in my story. And then I just kind of, I was like, oh, this can be later. Obviously I'll have to rewrite it, but the yeah. crux of it could be later. I, 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 I assume when people say that it's, they have like a really good um, section of dialogue or something that they want to save. And they, and they say, oh, I'll just change a bit of context and then I, this can come earlier or later. 
Yeah, I, I, I have to imagine that's what it is. I think perhaps it's just the way I have it plotted wouldn't work like that, especially because yeah. I use Save the Cat, which tells you the order of things to do. And considering I'm actually a fairly chaotic person and people always laugh at me because I'm fairly chaotic. However, when it comes to rules, it's funny you were saying about uh, magical rules, actually. I follow the rules. Like I'm the person that if there's a line drawn on the pavement and it says walk that line, I will not step over the line. <laughs> like I am that person. So if I have a plan... That is what's happening. End of discussion. It's very rare, unless I've got developmental notes or notes from a beta reader or had a much better idea after the draft is finished, I will follow that plan. So to me, moving the plan around just gives me hives. Yeah. I don't understand how I do it. <laughs> well, I mean, also, you have your plan down to, you know, where the major plot points are going to happen down to within like a couple of hundred words. Yes. Which is I do. bonkers to me. <laughs> You know, <laughs> yeah. that like, oh, in 2000 words, this major plot event is going to happen. Yes, that's exactly it. Yeah. So I, I leave notes at the top of each chapter. And because I work it out on my calculator, I know that in chapter three, say, we've got to hit two plot beats, but one of the plot beats is only happening three quarters of the way through or say two thirds of the way through for easy math. So that'll happen at the 2000 word mark. So I've got 2000 words to play with where there's this really cool, say, car chase scene. But I know at 2000 words, I've got to have them at the castle or it won't work. <laughs> so, then, so then I know I've got a thousand words of that bit. So I write a little sentence, 2000 words on this and then 1000 words of this. So I just can't move them. They, they, they don't move. It's not, this isn't, you can't just move things. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> when it's that out. rigid, like, you, you, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, really rigid. You, you can't, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm making it sound not fun. <laughs> <laughs> what happens if you're writing and you're like, you know, into the scene and then you look up and you're like, oh, no, the thing has to happen in 500 words. Yeah, that does happen. Oh. And so I go back and I cut down the scene slightly so that the thing will still happen. Every now and then, sometimes some things have gone slightly over or slightly under. Like, for instance, I've put something in and realized, actually, it's just not going to take as much room as I thought it might. Mm. So... I've moved stuff around a bit, but that will uh, that will occur to me during and I will fix it during. And yeah. I don't often go back over. So I'm like a speed writer. So I do sprints and stuff. I don't reread what I've just written. I make sure I end at the end of a chapter and I have my notes for the next one. So I do not reread what I read, the, what I did the day before. And I do not edit as I go. Like even typos, don't do it. I just keep going and going and going until I get to the end. Um, so yeah, it's unusual for me to go back and change it, but I will if I think it's going to put off kilter the whole plot that's a really good way of doing it. i the people that i've spoken to that have that have, have successfully putting out books quickly or like writing lots quickly are people who have that self-control and discipline to just write the first draft and not look back i've gotten better at it but i still every now and again i'll just it, it'll be I'll, it'll be when i pause and i'll look mm. up and i'll see i'll reread a line and then I'll, and as soon as i start editing i just yeah. kind of like i switch or my brain like changes gear and now i'm just and now i'm just editing the thing i just wrote and it's it's just the pace is gone the flow is gone yeah it's really really hard not to yeah. do like i definitely used to do that but no i think i just find first draft i'm like that edits i take a lot longer over and i think about and i also take huge breaks in between i don't write every day so i write very quickly and all in one big chunk so i don't forget what's happening and i don't have to reread anything and mm. then i'll have um, a couple of months off possibly where i may be plotting or thinking about another book i'm writing in that sense but i'm not writing prose yeah so i'll take some time off so yeah that's that, that's just how I work and I can do that. I'm in a privileged position where I can do that. I have a flexible job. You know, I don't have uh, like childcare to think about or anything like that. So I do understand it's definitely not plausible for everyone, but that is the way it works best for me. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think um, I always mention her, but <laughs> Zadie Smith uh, yeah. talks about one of the best things that you can do for uh, a book, as in while you're writing slash editing it, is to mm. just go away from it leave it alone for as long as you possibly can like, right if you could leave a, if you could write something write a few drafts of it then leave it for a year yeah it does help actually so the standalone i sold i sold in april 2021 mm. and with how publishing works i went on submission november 2020 and then i got the edits yeah. back for it 
a month ago and it was like I, it was like somebody else had written it because I hadn't <laughs> seen it in two years I just hadn't looked at it so I was like oh this is you know I was chuckling away at my own jokes and <laughs> I was like oh this is great this is all right and you that's don't hate it yeah yeah you don't want to throw it in the bin your own jokes. yeah yeah that's just me all the time yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh my God, I'm so funny <laughs> <laughs> I'm hilarious no wonder they wanted to buy this book um but it does it helps like because it feels like somebody else has written it and that's yeah. always easier to edit and you, yeah, you've, it's just fresh eyes, isn't it? Yeah. It's almost like you're critiquing your own, you're, well, you're critiquing someone else's, but it's your own thing. Yeah, it's so much easier. Do you, I mean, we've, we've mentioned um, Sanderson, uh, Stephen King, Neil Gaiman. Do you read many craft books or watch sort of video essays and stuff like that? Uh, I do. You told me about the Brandon Sanderson um, I tell everyone lectures. Yeah, you told everyone. Yeah, <laughs> you're everyone. on commission. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I do. I really like those. Um, and I told Stuart Wright at Right Mental, my boss, mm-hmm. uh, and he loves them as well now. Um, yeah, so I do yeah. like watching, and I have a few YouTubers I watch. Like I watch Alexa Dunn, and I watch I, mm-hmm. that. I do like to watch for stuff. And then obviously I've saved the cat, and my my copy of Save the Cat is like battered because I use it all the time, <laughs> and it's my bible for stuff. Um, and I l- love the Stephen King one because he has little anecdotes and the way it's told. Um, and then apart from that, I've read Bird by Bird and Lamotte. Uh, which is good because it's essentially telling you how to do it point by point, which is called why it's called bird by bird. So that's good for breaking things down. But I think now I, you know, you get bought them for Christmas and stuff when you say you want to be a writer. Yeah, and yeah. There, there is a list on Amazon that your family will go on and say like, oh, okay, <laughs> these are the ones and you'll get 15 copies of Stephen King's on writing and just keep giving them away to other people. Yeah. Um, but I think once you've read those ones, I haven't gone back and reread them. But craft books like, um, oh, The Emotions Thesaurus, that's a really good one that I go back to a lot because obviously I'm not going to learn a whole thesaurus. And it's great for, um, so if anyone's not read it, it's um, if you, my characters always roll their eyes all the time, especially because they're teenagers, so they're rolling their eyes. Mm -hmm. So The Emotions Thesaurus, you can go through, find Roll's eyes and find, oh, if they're frustrated, here's something else they could do. Or if they're rolling their eyes because they're bored, here's something else they could do. And it's really useful. So I reuse those, but I don't come back to graph books I've read. I read them like novels. I've read them. I put them yeah. away. Sure. Yeah. That makes sense. Because you've mm. kind of absorbed it at that point. And even if, you do, if you, even if you're not actively thinking about it, hopefully it's floating about in your subconscious somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. I think if I'm going to go back to new stuff, I will go on. YouTube's got so much good stuff. Or like masterclasses yeah. that you can sign up to and stuff like that. Do you have any books that you go back to? Like craft books? Yeah. No, with craft yeah. books, it's, I'm a sort of one and like you. It's like one one read through and, and I'm one and done. Kind of, yeah, like absorbed it. I feel like yeah. if I read it a second time, I'd be overthinking it. Yes, that's so true. Actually, you can start to. So there's a bit in Stephen King's on writing that really freaks people out, where he says, "If you and again, easy for him to say because obviously he had like a supportive partner and he had his writing shed, yeah. but he says if you haven't finished a draft in, I think it's three months, then you're not that bothered about it. You shouldn't bother oh, finishing right. it. And it's like, oh, okay. So he's like, he's a big pusher for the whole fast writing, which doesn't surprise me because he has like a thousand million books. And yeah, uh, but yeah, he's like, if you don't finish it in three months, then you're clearly just not that interested in it." and you're putting it off so yeah, yeah which yeah, yeah it's easy for him to say but that that is something people come back to i think when they read it and they pick that maybe that detail up the second time and panic mm. <laughs> so maybe yeah. that's why it's a bad reason to reread those books i think the other thing about craft books especially books when it's it, it's by um a famous author let's say someone yeah. like stephen king or mm. uh is is it's kind of like being in a critique group and and if let's say there's five people in the critique group and you know um where the kind of benefit of of each person lies for you yeah so like every kind of relationship between an author is going to be different because you both like different styles you both write in different ways the critique i've heard um and and i i do tend to agree with a, a lot about stephen king is stephen king is very absolute in some of the stuff that he suggests in yeah. his book that's true um the kind of one of the reasons i I really like the brandon sanderson lecture uh, the lectures that he puts up is is Mm -hmm. because he's very clear to state whenever he talks about a an approach to doing something or a style of doing something or the way he does something he says this is a way of doing it this is not the only way of doing it you need to find the way that works for you so maybe take you know a little bit of this maybe try it out try a bunch of different things see which works best for you like with stephen king he's also got the um the the no notes 
right? He, yeah. He, 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 don't take notes because if you don't remember it, it's not a good idea. Yeah. But, you know, some Brandon Sanderson has a million notes and he constantly references them. He, he creates his his world, his characters are amalgamations of the hundreds of notes that he makes. Yeah. So he'll like, he'll have a character which will be one note and then he'll flick back through his like magic system book and to one a magic system that he maybe came up with like a year before and then a world thing and he'll put them all together like a like a jigsaw so i think it's always important to remember even when it comes to some like a stephen king craft book that it just might not work for you yeah no i think that's really important and you're right he does say um i know he has a whole analogy about oh, the best job to have if you're a writer is a bricklayer because yeah. you can think about your book all day. But also I am aware that, you know, that's not great for everyone and people have different needs. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think it's just working out what your needs are as well, how it fits around your lifestyle. Um, because it can be like, for instance, me speed writing, especially where I am at my life in my life at the minute does really help with my lifestyle. And it means I can take that break, um, yeah. and do like other works. I do a lot of freelance work so I can pile up that freelance work for specifically times when I've got downtime from writing. So that does really help. So yeah, I think it's just each their own, isn't it? And is there ever, um, I mean, you're very active on Twitter. And it's not just Twitter. you posting your daily Wordle score. Yeah, which is always you, good. You must be one of the most consistent Wordlers in, in the world at this point. <laughs> I know, I know. I just can't help myself, especially if I get it in like two. I'm like, I've got, I've got to post it. <laughs> You've had some really, really good ones. And I've seen a lot of twos pop up from you. But yeah, yeah. Uh, big writing community on Twitter. Lots of um, not just support, which is great, but but also like advice and tips and things like that. Do you ever see stuff online and just go, wow, that's really bad advice? Yeah, all the time. Oh, there's yeah. always ones. And you go to DM groups, don't you? And you share the Twitter thread. Somebody's like, thread oh, yeah. coming. Here's my advice. And you're like, oh my God, this person's a psychopath. Like, what? why are they advising people to do this? Yeah, you see bad stuff all the time. I Obviously not naming names. But um, oh, the, my, my least favorite one, as I've said, because I don't do this especially, is you must write every day. Really annoys yeah. me. Because first of all, again, it's a privileged thing to be able to write every day and Mm -hmm. have the time and the space and the headspace. Because I know a lot of people say, because I did it, you know, when I was on the tube to my job, I just did it on my phone. It's like, well, maybe you had the headspace to do that. And other people don't, you know, people people have, um, you know, I've got um, friends who are housebound and they get tired more easily and they're not going to be able to write 3,000 words in a day. But I can binge 5,000 words in a day, but that's a more privileged position. So, no, I hate that one. That is my least favorite piece of writing advice is you must write every day. Um, yeah, that's the worst one. Anything with the word must in it is yeah. immediately <laughs> like, there's no right way to do this. You know? Yeah, it feels a bit like a t- oh, it just feels like as well. You immediately, as soon as you see the word "must," scroll back up to see who has posted this. What, like, what is? What yeah, are your yeah, credentials, yeah. sir? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like who are you? Wait a second, who are you? <laughs> yeah, wait a minute. I'm, I'm getting an existential crisis, but actually, who are you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think that can. I think you just basically using the word "must" is wrong. I think, but I think it can work for some people. Is the I try and write something every day, and it. Mm-hmm. It, it's part of that. Um, it's one of the Bruce Lee philosophies where it's uh, every single day take, no matter how big it is, take a step towards your goals. Right. Right. So I think it can work. And I think for some people, it's a really good idea to try and write every day, even if you're just writing one paragraph or like one sentence. Mm. I think that the, the better way to phrase that kind of advice is um, try and think about your book every day and whether that involves writing whether that just involves sort of pondering a plot or a character thing that i think that's sort of more healthy but at the same time yeah. someone like you 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 want to have days where you don't think about it at all yeah so that's it's true. such a personal thing yeah because i do think I, you're right i definitely have days off where i don't think about it at all but i you you're right actually in that i do think about my current project a lot mm-hmm. when i'm doing other stuff so I guess it, if it all is included in writing, then yes, I suppose you're doing a little bit towards it every day. And that's, that's, I think it's also probably good advice when you're starting out and a novel can just feel like 
such a mountain. And yeah. it's, you know, we're talking about 75,000 words and I'm saying, oh, because that keeps it a bit short. And I know that some of my <laughs> chapter book and middle grade writers are like, what, 75,000 words? It's so many words. Um, so yeah, I think it can also be quite good when you start. And advice changes with you as you go through. And sometimes you'll pick mm-hmm. up something you think it's great advice. And when you do it, it's not for you. Yeah. That's fine. You can change your mind. Like that's yeah, allowed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think just be wary of anything any, anything that says like this, you have to do this, you must yeah. do this. It's like, there's no real set way of doing anything. One no. that really annoyed me, and I only saw this because I f- follow um, Rihanna Pratchett mm-hmm. um, on Twitter, and she'd quote retweeted this tweet that where someone had, there was this long thread about that someone had proclaimed that if you ever want to be a professional writer, you have to write X thousand words every day, otherwise just give up. Uh, <laughs> and she like quoted retweeted it and said uh actually my father the late great terry pratchett of course. Uh, only used to write about a thousand words every day yeah and yeah. you know if if you're going to tell me that terry pratchett is not one of the most prolific authors <laughs> <laughs> of the last sort of few decades then like he often has entire shelves dedicated just to pratchett if you go into a bookshop yeah so that that advice i just it's things like that where it's like you have to do this thing and it's just it's, it's very no annoying. Good. Yeah. And especially when it's only going to, I hate it, especially, and I'm glad she flagged it because it might make some people feel really rubbish about their writing. Yeah. And that annoys me as well. Like you should never put anyone off if they want to go for it and start doing some writing. They're not hurting anyone, you know, just yeah. let them do it their own way. Don't make them feel bad. I don't want anyone to think, oh, I could never achieve that. It's way outside of my league. So I'm not, it's again, it's the un unscalable mountain isn't it you don't want mm-hmm. people to feel like they can't do it and, and i think a little part of people who give that sort of advice are being a bit snobbish and trying to sort of oh i'm going to sort the wheat from the traff here all right you've yeah. got to write three thousand words a day nah <laughs> i guess the, it, it feels like compensating as well it's like you have to do this thing and yeah like, because they do it and and i don't know but yeah. do what do whatever makes you happy you know exactly. and, and also a lot of a lot of that kind of advice is geared towards um you must write to be published and i think there's there's a rising sort of movement of people who just want to write uh because they enjoy writing and they enjoy sort of that cathartic uh exercise of putting words on a page making up a story right which is very healthy and i encourage all my friends to do it no it's nice i think writing is also one of those really nice things that we all speak a language so everyone can give it a go yeah. And you don't even need really, we're talking about Scrivener and Word and obviously computers and stuff, but write in a notebook if you want to, or on scraps of paper. Like that's what I like about writing. You kind of don't really need any tools and you don't really yeah. need yeah. any practice to start. You can just start. It's great. Well, like you were saying with the, uh, um, someone was saying, oh, I wrote every day on the train on my phone. Yeah. I've actually, he- I've heard a number of authors um whose books are now out and they th- that's where it started with them writing in their notes on their phones on their commutes or or, or what have you exactly wherever so really you can, can snatch anywhere. those moments then absolutely do that but also don't feel bad if you can't snatch those moments it's just <laughs> which is really annoying when people ask for advice on these sorts of things it's like do it but also don't do it and yeah, worry it, but, but don't, don't worry <laughs> i think the main thing is just make sure that you are enjoying it and yeah. like do the thing that makes you happy and it will come out in the writing yeah, I think that's yeah, I think that's the that's it's the thing, isn't it? About um, I can't remember what the study is called, but if you are bored when writing, um, it comes across to the reader, and if the if you take a reader, they'll say, oh, I think that the author was bored when writing this. And it's the same if you feel happy or sad, which is why I like listening to film scores when I'm writing certain things. Mm-hmm. Um, it comes across, so yeah, do what you need to do. Make sure you're p- replenished. If you don't want to write one day on a Tuesday and you've written every day for a hundred days, it's cool. It's fine. <laughs> You could take a break. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. Yeah. You can you can make it up the next day. <laughs> like yeah, <exactly. laughs> if you want make, to, but if yeah. otherwise don't. <laughs> Just enjoy writing. That's the best advice that I think have anyone fun. Can you enjoy must it. have fun yeah, writing. You must. <laughs> you have to have fun. <laughs> oh, amazing. Amazing. Well, I w- this is usually the time where I would ask you uh which book you would bring to the desert island. Mm. Um you Probably still have the most unusual choice. Uh, <laughs> oh God! Which is the Argos catalog. Yeah, the Argos catalog, which they're bringing back. Apparently, is that would that still be your choice? If you if you someone rescued you and you got taken back out and dumped on that desert island, but yeah, would you still take the Argos catalog? Cling to it? 
<laughs> Do you know, I'm still, I am still tempted to keep the Argus. The thing, I'm not a rereader of books. I read a book and it, it's dead to me. No, I read a book and it's done. <laughs> like it's, it's finished. I'm done with it. Even the craft yeah. books, like I'm finished. Um, I don't, I don't enjoy rereading books because I know what's going to happen. So, you know, why, why, why? Yeah, exactly. Um, but I think if. I was still on the desert island. I think I now should take something maybe now I think about it because I know I'm going to get rescued. You just told me the ending of my story. No, no, no. Um, you got rescued <laughs> once and 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 uh, they tried to take the Argos catalogue from you. This is like a, this <laughs> is like my, a write your own story adventure. Do you cling to the, the Argos catalogue or do you snatch something else? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, You know, I always felt like I'm going to admit something now and everyone's going to be cross. Um, I've never read Lord of the Rings. That that is interesting. I yeah, I would never. have expected you. I bet you don't mention that, and you let people think that you've read Lord of the Rings. Yeah, when people are talking about like specifically the book, I'm like, uh-oh. uh oh, ah. and I just nod like, mm hmm, yeah, yeah. Like, was this in the movie? I don't remember. All you um, need to do in that conversation is just say, oh yeah, like in the Silmarillion, and then people just assume you've read all of the Tolkien stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I feel like I feel like probably that would be a good, but if very boring answer. However, I am very chaotic, so no. Probably if they took me off the island like in Lost and it's not really Penny's boat and they send me back I probably would cling onto the Argos catalogue like a deranged sun beaten <laughs> woman and uh, just k- carry on making my little origami people out of the pages and using it to start fires and things like that for survivalism so yeah I'd probably just keep it actually now I think about it I'm trying to be clever uh, no I'd just keep my Argos catalogue trying to be clever yeah. I don't know how you'd make a fire out of the laminated pages of the Argos catalogue <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to like really scrunch them up a little bit. I don't know. Inhaling some fumes. Who knows what's on this island? I mean, maybe it's just the (laughs) other side of like Big Island in Hawaii and I could just walk across and get a a drink, get a mojito. I don't know. (laughs) Yeah, maybe you can just swim to like the local bar. (laughs) Maybe book is the least of my worries on this island. That's all I'm saying. (laughs) It was a trick the whole time. I'm just, people are fixating on the book, but I never told them where the island was. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. Maybe I could just go and charge my Kindle up in the hotel room. It's fine. (laughs) Oh, amazing. Okay. Okay. So it's still the Argos catalogue. Well, yeah, of course. thanks so much, Melissa, for coming back on and, and chatting and, and talking all about uh, your process and then the craft or how it all works. No, it's really good fun. Thanks for having me. And for everyone listening, if you want to keep up with everything that Melissa is doing, you can follow her on Twitter and Instagram at Meliva, M-E-L-L-I-V-E-R. And to make sure you don't miss an episode of this podcast, follow us on Twitter at Right and Wrong UK or on Instagram at Right and Wrong Podcast. Thanks again to Melissa for coming on and chatting. And thanks to everybody for listening. We'll catch you in the next episode. Thanks for hanging around until the end. If you're interested in starting your own podcast but aren't really sure what that looks like, I can't recommend Zencaster enough. It's so simple to host, record and download your podcast with and it even has a built-in transcription AI. It functions entirely in the internet browser, which means all your guests have to do is click on a link and they'll be brought into the conversation. If you click on the link in the description, you'll get 30% off the first three months. All you have to do is click on the link in the description. Thanks again for supporting the show and we'll see you in the next episode.